am Shelley Irwin, a guest host from WGVU Public Radio and Television. Honored to be here to speak with your Diversity Lecture Series speaker. And I'm honored to speak with the author of Then They Came For Me. Boy, Maziar Bahari, appreciate you being here and nice sharing a here. pretty intense story, my friend. Yes, congratulations well, on your success, first of all. Well, thank you very much. They gave me a lot of good material to work with, <laughs> unfortunately, I guess. Let's just cut to the chase. You have a lot of marks on this, uh, this front cover. Um, you spent uh, 118 days in prison, 107 in solitary confinement. How does one get over this? Um, you have to, uh, because it's like everything in life that it's an experience that you go through while you are in that experience, while you're in that situation, it's a very difficult situation, of course. But after that, you have two choices. You either can isolate yourself, not talk about it, or you can just express your feelings, you can speak out. And I chose the second option. And uh, because even until now, I'm the only high profile prisoner who was arrested after the election and let's uh, out of the country, out of Iran, I thought that I was, I had, an op I had an obligation to talk on behalf of my friends who are still in prison, my friends who cannot talk. So I became their voice and I became their face as well. And as a result, I think I feel better about that. I mean, I may not sound too good today because I have a cold, but in general, I feel much You're better. You're only yeah. human. I want to obviously hit some of the highlights, but I'd like you to take us back. You were actually born in Tehran? I was born in Tehran, mm -hmm. grew up in Tehran until I was 18, then left for Canada, and then uh, I've been living back. And, I mean, I was based in London from 1995, but I spent a lot of time in Iran, Iraq, and other countries in the Middle East. Yeah. You pursued the career of journalism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Newsweek. Uh, an important yes. Part I, of your well, life yeah. Here. I started my career as a documentary filmmaker, but then uh, when I went back to Iran in '97, uh, I started writing for Newsweek, and it was an exciting time because after years of tyranny and after years of dictatorship, people uh, chose a elected a reformist, pro-reform uh, mm -hmm. president to power. And people thought they could change the system from within, so it was quite a euphoric atmosphere. And I thought, and I was really, I was really glad that I was living in Iran at the time. And so I started. I mean, I continued doing my documentaries, but also I wrote for Newsweek and other publications. Yeah, family as well. Time as well, yes, yeah. Yes, Paula and Mariana. Paula and Mariana. Take yes. me back to June 2009, please. Mm -hmm. Well, in June 2009, uh, there was a presidential election in Iran. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the running for second term. Of course, he was the uh, candidate of the conservatives. And he was running against the former prime minister of Iran, who was um, Mir Hossein Mousavi, who was the prime minister in 1980s in Iran for eight years. And Musavi was among the people that we can say he went through a revolution of second thoughts. He doubted about the, he had doubts about his past uh, policies, the history of the Islamic Republic. He became a moderate after being out of power for almost 20 years. So he adopted policies that many young people, most young people in Iran, I think they, uh, supported Musavi because of uh, his liberal, his uh, more open interpretation of the religion. And um, so uh, it was basically, I think, a battle between the people who had knowledge of the outside world, people who knew about what's going on in the world, people who watch satellite uh, television, people who uh, use the internet to gain access to information. And the people who, um, not necessarily bad people, we can say, but people in very claustrophobic, uh, contained environments who did not know much about the rest of the world. And the, it's, it was never a situation that it was like a class warfare between uh, the poor people and the middle class. 
you had people, very poor people, who were educated, who were uh, who had who had a more liberal, open interpretation of the religion, who supported uh, Musavi. And then you had some rich people who were more traditional and supported Ahmadinejad. So in June, uh, on June 12th, the election happened, and most people thought that Musavi had won because from what you could see on the streets and from also some secret uh, surveys, uh, Musavi was the winner of the election. Mm -hmm. But then on that night, on the, the 12th, I mean, even before the ballots were, uh, the polls were closed, they uh, said that Ahmadinejad was the winner. And it was, uh, it was a really depressing moment. But on the third day after the election, on, on June 15th, people came to the streets. And we really didn't know uh, how many people would show up. We thought that maybe a few thousand would show up and just uh, the vigilantes and the government security can uh, crush them. But to my surprise, Crowds? at least three million people oh. showed up. And it was interesting because I was on the same street where I was at, as a kid in 1979 watching millions of people demonstrating against the Shah of Iran. And then on the same street, I could see millions of people, almost the same amount of people, demonstrating against Ahmadinejad and through Ahmadinejad uh, against the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, mm. who is the current uh, supreme leader. <clears throat> so the demonstrations went on for like four days. Uh, it started on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then on the Friday, June 19th, Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, came out and said that people have to go home. And if not, they're going to face the consequences. People meaning the citizens? People mm -hmm. who were demonstrating against mm -hmm. him and his chosen mm -hmm. uh, president, Ahmadinejad. And then on Saturday, the 20th, of June, I saw some of the most horrible images that I've ever seen in my life. Including death? I didn't see any death. I've recorded, actually, I, I had the only footage of uh, the besieged, the paramilitary forces, shooting people on June 15th. But that's a separate story. We can talk about that later. But on the Saturday, I didn't see any death. And actually, the government is quite smart in not killing people because they know how martyrdom is celebrated in mm -hmm. Shizam. So they, want, they don't want to kill people as much as possible, but they want to crush people as much as possible. So I saw uh, men, women, young girls being beaten up, beaten up really, really badly by revolutionary guards and without any mercy. It was just, it was really horrifying. Yeah, but when you, I say you horrifying, probably couldn't have helped. I could not help. No, I could not help. And I could not even record it because if they saw my camera, I would be subject to beating as well. So we were just, I was on a motorcycle and we were just uh, going around and, you know, pretending that we were stuck in the traffic. And when I say horrible, I mean, I've worked in Iraq, I've worked in Africa and Afghanistan, and I had seen many horrible things. So on that day, it was really, really... Uh, a sad day. And when I went back home at night and I saw the footage of Neda Agasultan, the woman who was shot by the paramilitary and killed right in front of the camera, that was just unbearable. So, and I had been working, uh, let's say, on June 20th for maybe two or three weeks without that much sleep. And I couldn't go to sleep, so I had a bottle of whiskey. Yes, yes. The smuggled mm -hmm. whiskey. Is always exactly. A good thing, right? yeah. <laughs> I had a bottle of whiskey, and I had maybe half of the bottle in order to go to sleep. And then when I woke up the next morning, I was I was woken up by my mother. Because my, you were with mother, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, because I was. Really? I didn't have my own place in Tehran. I was living in London with my fiance at the time, Paula, and. So I was with my mother, I was staying at my mother's house, and my mother woke me up around 8 o'clock in the morning, and she said that, dear, there are four gentlemen here who want to take you. How and did she say that? Did you? She said it in a very, very calculated way, mm -hmm. because it was the third time that she had seen someone from her family being arrested. First, my father was 
arrested in 1953 because he was a communist at the time fighting against the Shah. Then in 1983, my sister was arrested because she was fighting against Ayatollah Khomeini, mm -hmm. the uh, founder of the revolution. And then, uh, of course, in 2009, my mother woke me up and she said that these uh, people are here and they want to take you away. And first, I mean, the, my first reaction was I felt really sorry for my mother that I, I had to put her through this. And it was, right, it was a real sense of guilt because I always tried to avoid politics. I never became a political activist. Of course, I was writing about politics. And but you had fear, too. I oh, yes, as a journalist, you know, in Iran, as a, working like a, I always said, even before my arrest, that working as a journalist in Iran is like a tightrope walking. You know, it's like if you always have to be careful not to fall. And, you know, that was my fall, I guess, when they came to arrest me. And then they searched the house. They basically, they ransacked the They went through apartment. your DVD, they, their, their the, tapes? Yes, or? They went through all my tapes. Yeah. And I have a lot of books and DVDs. And it was a real... Uh, on a familiar, strange territory to them because they were used to more religious, more traditional families, and you know, because most of the people that they arrest these days or in those days, they are the people who were also part of the revolution, people who changed their position and but they became, they, they, they you know, they remained religious and they, so they were on the same wavelength as them, but. In my house, it was totally, totally different. Yeah. And they were just saying, you know, like some Hollywood films, some HBO box sets, then their magazines, and they were just didn't know what to do. So they confiscated a lot, but they also left a lot behind. And then they blindfolded me and took me to somewhere, they said. And they didn't tell me who they were. Hmm. They didn't tell me, yeah. Yeah, where bring, they were bring from. Rosewater into this. Okay. Yeah. Well, Rosewater was the man who uh, arrested me, yeah. and he became my interrogator as well. So in that morning, when I woke up, I didn't see anyone in the beginning because I was so drunk, in a sense, and, you know, and I was also so sleepy. But I could smell his mm -hmm. smell of rose water. And rose water is something that, um, you know, they, in, in Shia shrines, they splash rose water in order to get rid of the bad odor in the place. So I thought I was in a shrine. I didn't know where I was. So Which brought you back to childhood memories. Childhood yeah. memories, wow. exactly, where my aunts used to take me to uh, these shrines. So Mr. Rosewater, because I didn't know his name, he took me to the interrogation room, which I realized from the direction that we were going, I realized that we were going to Evin Prison, which was the most, which is the most notorious prison in Iran and one of the most notorious prisons in the world. And he told me that, uh, I said, why am I here? What is my, why was I arrested? Why am I, what are my charges? Mm -hmm. And he said, you are charged with espionage? And I said, spying for who, which agencies, if you don't mind? And I was very differential, I was very polite. And he said, for Israeli Mossad, for American mm -hmm. CIA, British MI6, and Newsweek. And I said, Newsweek, you mean Newsweek magazine? And he said, yes, your quote unquote magazine is part of the American intelligence apparatus. And there and then I knew that there was a scenario that I was part of a game that I didn't know what it was. And it started like that, you know, and it became more ridiculous because, because the charges against me were so outlandish because they had no evidence whatsoever against me. And because they were trying to force me into confessing something that I was not, they just uh, threw ridiculous charges. And because uh, they had no charges, the charges, you know, they became more and mm -hmm. more ridiculous. You know. But yet, what were your first memories of the physical Evan, E-V-I-N, the prison? Mm -hmm. What, uh, I mean, we've got 107 days in solitary confinement to talk it about. Is, it is what the regime wants uh, 
to portray itself. You know, uh, Evin prison is a very solid prison. It is a very big complex. It's relatively clean to many other prisons, apparently, because uh, some friends who have spent time in other prisons have told me that Evin is one of the cleanest prisons. The food is okay. I always say that it's better than most airline foods. I mean, it doesn't well, say much. <laughs> it doesn't say much, you but go. you know, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the food is not bad. But it's very, it's really intimidating. You know that you cannot escape from heaven. You know that it's impenetrable. You know that uh, even your thoughts can be monitored. You know, or that's the image that. Uh, so it was difficult to get used to that. No lawyer allowed. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, when, during the 118 days that I was in prison, and I had a lawyer hired for me like on the first day, but he had no access. And he tried. He really tried. I mean, my lawyer and many other lawyers and human rights advocates and activists, they're really brave people, and they really try to find some holes in the system and try to do something for their clients. But no, my lawyer could not um, see me. Talk at about all. the yeah. relationship with Rosewater. Hmm. Where did we well, progress? Rose, or yeah, Rosewater became uh, basically became in charge of my life, and that was quite smart of them because what they did was that they uh, put someone in charge of arresting me. He was my interrogator, and he always told me that uh, if anyone is going to free to free you, it will be me. So he was basically basically person that uh, was running my life, and he I mean people called him my master. You know, it was really a, a weird uh, relationship. Well, and and what, how did you play into that? Did you I mean did you milk that? Did you? play his game? Did you? Well, in the beginning, I was, I didn't know what I was dealing yeah. with because he was interrogating me and he was. Did he abuse you? In the beginning, he did not beat me. In the beginning, he just asked me these questions. And, and you know, when you're in Evin prison, when you know that there were thousands of people who were killed there, and you know uh, thousands of people, maybe hundreds of innocent people, have been killed there without any charge, on fabricated charges, sometimes even by mistake. And they admitted that you know it was a mistake. Then you are really intimidated that someone like that mm -hmm. is, uh, like Rosewater is interrogating you. So at the beginning, I was really intimidated, and I didn't know what to do. But I was maybe fortunate enough to have uh, the memories of my father, mm -hmm. who spent three years um, in jail in the 50s, and my memories of my sister, who spent uh, six years in prison in the 80s with me. Yeah. So they became my companions. And you know, if you imagine Evan as a universe, and then myself as part of the, that universe, I try to create some universe inside mm -hmm. me. Almost an imaginary so, An imaginary, friendship. yes, yeah. an imaginary place that he doesn't know anything about. So I could uh, find solace in that imaginary place, in that imaginary universe. And that really helped me. That really helped me. And that also allowed me to humanize Rosewater because he did not want me to regard him as a human being. He wanted me to regard him as a monster who could do anything to me. But of course, he was a human being. Human being with a lot of faults. Human being with, uh, he was very kind to his wife, for he example. He was younger, right? Younger he was young, he was about yeah. 30, 31 years yeah. old. And he was very kind to his wife, because his wife used to call him at work. And he was very loving on the phone to his wife. And sometimes when he was very brutal to me, he was very kind to his and wife. And he would be brutal to you, why? Uh, because I was not uh, playing, I was not uh, saying things that he wanted me to say. Basically, what they wanted me to do was to say that I was putting the reformists in the system in touch with foreigners. And they had this scenario for me and two other people who worked with uh, Western uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. One had a... Yeah was hired by George Soros' uh, Open Society Institute. 
in Iran, and another one was a political advisor in the British Embassy. So they wanted the three of us to play uh, this role of putting the reformists in touch with the foreigners. And I never said that, because I knew if I admitted that, that would be the end of me. Instead, I stuck to generalities. I talked how bad the West was, how wow. okay. much, you know, uh, how devious uh, different uh, organizations are that, you know, all the newspapers and magazines, they are part of this uh, movement to topple the Iranian regime, whatever, but I never named names. And that's really, really drove him crazy. And it went on. It went on for almost two months that he kept on, you know, uh, torturing me psychologically first. And then mm -hmm. he started to beat me and, you know, kick me and slap me, like physical torture, mm -hmm. really. Were you, we mentioned Paola, and uh, of course uh, your mother, did you, in Newsweek, I mean, did you have any clue that they might have been looking for you or that you were I making any hoping, headlines? Yeah, I was hoping that they were doing that. But I had no clue, I mean, because I was not in touch with uh, anyone, you know. Rosewater was my only uh, yeah. contact with the rest of right. the world. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I'm not a very spiritual person, but inside prison, I felt this positive energy that, yes, uh, my parents, my mother mm -hmm. and Paula, they were... Uh, uh, doing some, they had a campaign for me, but I didn't have any facts. And yeah. sometimes I would become really depressed that, you know, what if they're not doing that? Right, right. And then the, the interrogation became even more ridiculous because... Uh, Were there ever any guns to your head? No, yeah. no, no yeah. guns to my head, no. But... They know, I mean, they are, they are quite mm -hmm. smart. They know that uh, the traditional methods of torture, they don't really, really break people. You know, first of all, they, they know that if you're in a bad physical condition and if you have bad food, uh, you, you become ill. And then you have this really uh, strange uh, dreams. And then you may have a different uh, you're self-empowering yourself in order to get over your weakness. So that self-empowerment, mm -hmm. that can defeat the torturer's uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. So they keep you physically well in order to be able to control you better because they know that if you are, if you're weak, then you can uh, have hallucinations of you know, power. Yes. So they are very sophisticated. They don't use mm -hmm. any kind of old-fashioned methods of right. torture yeah. that were practiced in the 50s mm -hmm. or even 70s sure. in yeah. Iran. This is 2009. Or even the 80s, yeah. Take so, us to yeah. those, uh, those last few days in Kettering. So, um, yeah, so what happened was that uh, I did not know what was going on, and you know, I was in my solitary confinement. And I, you know, because I was in solitary confinement and I had nothing to do, I was doing a lot of exercise. I was doing a lot of push-ups, sit-ups, and then one day, uh, one of the prison guards, who was not a revolutionary guard, but was part of the judicial system and just a, just a simple worker, he told me, Mr. Hillary Clinton, get up. And I said, what? And he, he said, yeah, Hillary Clinton, he's been, she's been talking about you a lot. And that was maybe the best uh, day in my imprisonment because there and then I knew that there was a campaign going on for me. I knew that the world was paying attention to my case. And because I'm not an American citizen, I knew that there must be a big campaign going on for me that the yes. Secretary of State of the United States is talking about me. So after that, uh, it's the situation changed after 107 days. They took me to a solitary, uh, to a communal cell, with uh, some other uh, prisoners, mostly political activists. And in order to save face, they said that you have to work with us. And you know, uh, during my relationship, my time in prison, and during the interrogation, I uh, managed to 
keep a rose water somehow entertained with stories. And, you know, because I knew that he was fascinated with the West and also he was a very sexually frustrated person. I kept on uh, making up these stories about the West, about the massages mm -hmm, and things mm -hmm. like that, which I explained in the book. Yes. And then um, he said that uh, you have to spy for us. And I said, okay, I will do that. And then I went through these really outlandish stories that how I can spy for them, that I can just go to Henry Kissinger's office, put eavesdropping devices there. And I was just using my imagination based on all the films that I had seen and everything. And yeah. so they finally, after 118 days, they let me go. Of course, I was bailed out. I was not uh, released. I was, it was a space saving measure for them because they could not really hold me much longer because of the international pressure mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but they told me that, you know, you have to work with us. Otherwise, we can find you anywhere in the world and we can always bring you back in a bag. So that day you stepped out of the prison. Yeah. What was that like with it three was, months left? Yes. It was <laughs> not as if that I've left the prison, though. You know, it was, it wasn't, you know, um, after three days when I came out of prison, I took the flight from Tehran to London. And until I crossed the Iran-Turkish border, I did not feel that I was free because it had happened before that some people were taken out of the airplane and taken back to jail. So I did not feel free at all. I mean, I was very happy to see my mother and my friends and many relatives who came to see me. But I didn't feel free. Yes. I, I remember clearly that I, I went to the plane and I had heard about uh, the movie Hangover and the seat next to me was uh, free. So I put the map on the, uh, the seat next to me and I was watching Hangover. So I was watching the map and Hangover at the same time. And as soon as wow. the, we crossed the Turkish border, I realized that I was free. And actually it was interesting that a lot of people on the plane who knew me because of the media uh, coverage, they did not feel comfortable and to come and greet me before we, uh, we went after, uh, we crossed the Turkish yeah, border. Yeah. And so they came to me as well, and they said, you know, congratulations and all yeah. that. Yeah. Well, Bahari, you write this story and more. Then they came for me, a family story of love, captivity, and survival. Is there a take home message from this read? What do you want your, your readers to take away from uh, your story? Well, I think it's a, I mean, there's, it's a multi-layered story, I guess. It is, it's a universal story of hope. It's a universal story of a family story, really, and how strong the bonds are in a family that whatever happens to you, even if you die, those bonds do not die. And that uh, the fact the family is the most important element in your life. And then I hope that I somehow humanize uh, different characters in the book that uh, in whatever situation you are, you can always find humanity in people. And it's not from a very altruistic point of view. I'm not a very altruistic person. It's a very for selfish reasons that, you know, if you're dealing with someone as a monster, then you cannot manipulate that person. But if you are dealing with someone as a human being, then you have the upper hand and then you can manipulate. So um, it that and hopefully people can learn a little bit more about Iran. And it's very yes, important well. for Americans to know about Iran because no. who knows what will happen in the next few months or few years. But Iran-America relations is very important. Yes, headlines uh, presenting all kinds of, of uh, issues. So stay in touch yeah. with that. Stay in touch with West Michigan. Thank you for serving Thank as uh, yet another GRCC Diversity Lecture Series speaker. And of course, then they came for me. Share a website, please. Uh, the, my website is maziarbahari.com, M-A-Z-I-A-R-B-A-H-A-R-I.com. Great. Thank you for watching. I'm Shelley Irwin. Take care.